one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, it's not very, it's not very often, it's not every day that the kinds of things that we talk about here are in the news. And actually, they are this week um, because a very well-known psychologist, uh, Jamie Pennebaker at University of Texas, published a study this week um, looking at narrative structure and um, published the findings, pretty prestigious journal. And... um, they found some interesting things about how we tell stories. And I think it's important to talk about it because what he did was found there is kind of a universal narrative structure that works. And the fact that it's universal suggests, certainly isn't proven by the study, but suggests and it's something that could be used, could could be subjected to further study. It suggests that there's a universal structure of stories because there's a universal way of understanding information. And that's really important. Um, and, And their ongoing studies will take a look at that. But it also echoes the way children learn and I mean, that's, that suggests that we have to kind of at least meet the minimum requirements. Yes, there's lots of room for creativity, but um, I just think it's very interesting how they did their study and what they found. I won't dwell on it at length, but what they did was they kind of measured um, sort of the invisible words in narratives. And they looked at thousands upon thousands upon thousands of stories, whether they were um, screenplays or or novels. And they looked at nonfiction. They looked at Supreme Court decisions. They looked at New York Times stories. They just looked at a huge corpus um, of information and and storytelling and so what they found is at the beginning um there are a lot of articles uh the um and and um and prepositions so so these are words so articles of course always precede nouns so there are things and prepositions, things telling the relationship of things. So you're kind of you're you're kind of laying out you're you're, you're putting out the lay of the land. There are these things, and they're related to one another, you know, in these ways. And that moves on to a sequence of verbs. So you have action words, um, and and you have action and interaction kind of in that next phase followed by a phase in which you're toward you're reaching toward a climax and there are a lot of cognitive words like believe understand um he he thinks um she she surmises um so there's mental activity suggesting dilemma resolution of a dilemma and and that's kind of the three part important sequence um of narrative development um and as i said i really think it's important because it suggests that um there there's a need there are things that we need in order to understand um, and they have to be there pretty much in a certain order. The interesting thing of the, among the findings was that adherence to, um, the, there was no implication of, of quality with adherence to um, the structure. So the structure didn't dictate the quality, the quality 
of any narrative and its pleasantness still depended on the creativity of the content um, and, the, and the interest that could be brought to the content. But nevertheless, it, the storytelling follows this arc. And um, the thing that I find very interesting is that um, it isn't that people can deviate from that structure. I mean, just like horror is an emotion that we don't really want to have, when emotion is carefully titrated in doses, people pay money to be exposed to horror. So in the hands of an expert who can dole out horror in careful doses along with a whole bunch of other emotions and pace them a certain way, so can stories deviate from the narrative arc. Um, you can begin with a punchline um, and then tell a story backwards. God knows we have movies um, that do that. And, and um, biographies all the time, we know the ending of the story in a biography. Um, but so the skill comes in, there's still so much room for creativity and there's so much room for skill, which comes in leaving that deviation from the structure best left to, to the hands of experts who know how to sort of carefully pace you know, the giveaway with information that you need to understand. So, and I think really only experts can, and, and gifted storytellers um, know how to sort of interweave that kind of revealing information with setting up kind of information. So there's lots of room for creativity, but I just thought it was very interesting because not every day do we get news of, about storytelling? And it's like, yay for our team. Um, uh, we, we made it into the news. Um, so I, I think it's especially true in nonfiction, of the way that information has to be doled out in order to achieve understanding and you have to really, if you don't meet that arc, you're going to baffle the audience in, in nonfiction. And they're just, the minute you start baffling people, rather than intriguing them, um, then they're going to tune out because no one voluntarily wants to devote their time to being made miserable by a piece of information that they aren't required to read. So that was my thought for the day. I thought I'd open with that. And um, I, it's open for discussion. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's a good place to start in talking about writing, art writing articles, writing books, editing, anything, presenting information of any kind, any way. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. So Pamela, looks like you've got something. So I totally, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, okay cool. Uh, I totally struggle with the narrative arc and pulling it together. I hate doing outlines. I'd rather just dive into writing. Uh, rather than making an outline or a plan first. And this manifests in so many areas. Um, so like when I, even when I'm doing like PowerPoint decks for work, I can like pull the different pieces together and all the contents there, but then everyone's like, what's the storyline? Or even when I'm writing, uh, whether it's the book or even just an article, like, I don't know, I just really struggle with this. I'm better at like pulling the pieces and putting it together rather than coming from the from the top down 
So I really struggle with this and, and I would love any <laughs> advice. So, you know, I empathize with you in terms of jumping in, okay? And I, I will speak only from my own experience um, because I also like to jump in. I never have an outline before I begin. Um, I, have, I have an idea of certain things I want to cover. And I may have it before I start, but I usually don't, or at least not formally. What my articles usually start, I'm, I'm devoting much of my energy to, as I'm getting close to writing, I'm devoting much of my energy to, how am I gonna get into it? What's gonna be, what's gonna be my path of breadcrumbs into this? However, I have to say in all fairness that I've devoted, if I'm writing, I've devoted a lot of time to researching. So way before I even begin writing, I, what I do is essentially, if I were to diagram it, I draw a giant circle around, this is the zone of what I'm looking at. And I need to know everything that's in that zone because I have to account for it in one way or another. Even if I'm not going to focus on it, I certainly need to know how it relates, something that I'm not focusing on, but that's in the zone, how it relates to what I am going to focus on. And I think a lot of pieces need to do that. But after I start and after I get my hopefully creative beginning going, because there are so many different ways to enter a story. You can enter in the middle. You can enter in the beginning. You can enter in the end. Once I get that beginning down, that's when I'll sit down and outline would be too formal a name for what I do, but I will kind of list or, 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 yeah, list is a fair enough word. I will write down the topics and pretty much their sequence. Um, and um, I think at some point you have to do that. Not only does it reduce the struggle but you know, you know the size of the arena that you're in. And it contains your imagination. And at some point, you need that constraint on the imagination. You need to know what's going to be, what you're covering. And you need to know because you need to have enough information on the things that you are going to talk about. So you definitely need that. And whether you do it, how formally you do it is up to you. It's, you know, how you work best, you know, whether you need 10 words or one word, you know, on your notepad as to, you know, where are you going to go? Sometimes I'll use quotes as a way of marking, you know, my progress if I've interviewed interesting people and I've got some really exciting ways of opening a topic or closing a topic or, or moving the narrative along. Um, but I do think you, at some point, you need, you need that boundedness. You need the knowledge of the arena that you're in, even if you don't know where you're going to, exactly how you're going to end or how the parts are going to relate to one another, you need to know the things you're going to cover. Not that that won't change while you're writing, it will. Um, not that book outlines don't change. Even after you get a book contract, they do. If you're doing research or, 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 um, even writing a memoir, the relation of things to another, one another could change. So I, I do think at some point you really have to contain the arena 
and I don't think I don't think it sacrifice sacrifices creativity at all. It just it gives you the space in which you can let your imagination roam free because there's nobody who's going to be writing about everything every time they sit down and write. And you have to know what the things are that you are going to be delving into. Does that make sense, Pamela? Yeah, and then that makes me even think once you have it outlined, I think an area I also kind of struggle is the transitions. So I think that would probably be helpful if I outlined it and then even made like the links between the parts. Yeah. Um, yes, the links between are really important. And in fact, uh, I mean, there are a million and five ways to make links between things. But, and, and creativity definitely plays into that. So does the information that you have. Um, and sometimes I don't know how I'm gonna relate one thing to another. Sometimes my outline helps me my very rough outline. I mean, I do not do an, you know, an, a one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, you know, and then back down again. My outlines look nothing like that. They are interesting documents, though. I mean, I, I wish I had one here. I kind of, it would have a lot of arrows on it. Um, but um, yeah, the connections of things. And there are a million and five ways to connect things. I wouldn't worry about them until, I mean, if you had an idea when you're, this is, you know, in the big picture thinking, when you're sort of describing the arena that you're in, and these are the things that are in it. If you know how one thing relates to another, write it down, capture it because that's one less thing you're gonna to have to worry about when you get to it. Now you may discard that in favor of a different way of relating to things, but, um, but at, least, at least you know when you set out on your journey um, why you're including things, because this relates to that and that relates to the other thing in this way. And then that comes back to the main point. And, you know, there should be a coherent way that things relate to each other. And not every chapter in a book has to relate to the preceding one in exactly the same way. Some can be tangents, some can be um, um, time progressions. Some can be idea and theme progressions. Um, some can drill down on something without advancing the narrative. You just suddenly dig a deep, you know, drill deeply on something and add to the richness rather than move the plot forward. So all of those things can be accommodated. You get to, you know, all of a sudden you're telling a story and then you get to some explosive incident that really deeply colored your life. You could drill down on that and spend a chapter, two chapters, and then move back into the, you know, move on with the flow of the narrative um, after that. So there are no laws governing that. I mean, it's how you do it and whether you're holding the attention of the reader because there is enough richness in the detail of what you're relating. So. Thank you, that's helpful. Good. Um, Hara? Yeah? Hi, Hi. Hannah. Hi. Hi. Um, I just, um, you know, I'm starting to write this um, book about my mother, who was a ceramic artist. And I just went to a memoir workshop, you know, with Joyce Maynard. And I was thinking that I was gonna write it in a memoir kind of way. 
and um, and I learned so much because I'm somebody who I'm good at a lot of things, but I would never say I'm a writer. You know, although mm -hmm. I did major in art history and wrote a very good thesis many many moons ago, and um, but I just had a meeting with the gallery owner, you know, who's also, you know, a uh, he's not just a salesperson. He's very much into art history and, um, you know, delving deep. And he said for this first book, um, he said that would come later. But right now we want to have a book that, you know, tells more about her career, you know, more from an art history point of view. But I'm wondering how... Um, and I don't know if this is your field of expertise, but how to integrate some personal things with, you know, just her journey, um, you know, as an artist, because she was a woman ahead of her time. And she was in the same um, milieu of, you know, the beginning of abstract expressionism and you know there's this book i think we talked about it ninth street women and she was right there for 10 years in that group but you know she cho chose to move to the suburb she was married and she chose to have children um mm -hmm. so i'm just wondering how to integrate some personal but also with you know her life as an artist and as a, an innovator. So, I mean, you know, the thing that jumps immediately to mind is to do it the way she did it, which is through her pieces. Yes. You, know, you could take a sequence of pieces that she did over time that have to be related to one another. But let's say you could take 10, 10 important pieces of work that she did and have each one represent, tell the story of that piece, which includes, you know, the work and, and, and what she was doing in her life and what went into it and how she did it. And so you're integrating everything about that piece. Um, and you may choose pieces in a sequence of time that help move your narrative automatically move your narrative forward you know um I, you know i can think of you know um you know clay woman or you know you could you could use you could use the word clay you know as a because so many images come to mind with it you know and not the word pottery, but, you know, or potter, but, you know, clay is this plastic, earthy substance and use that as your reigning metaphor, you know, and, and move the story forward through focusing on a bunch of pieces. I am sure the gallery owner would be thrilled because, you know, you're putting the art front and center, but it sounds like that's what your mother did too. Oh, Absolutely. Well, you know, that's the plan because I do have lots of photos and we're going to do, um, you know, it's going to be mostly photos because the photos um, tell the story. Um, however, I like this idea of, you know, there still can be a lot of photos, but then focusing on certain pieces and that being the container right. for bringing in, oh, I love this. Thank you. Like, <laughs> you're helping me so much. <sighs> sure. I mean, and, the, and then, you know, your structure is there. It solves a great number of problems. And, you know, a lot of writing is, is problem solving. Uh -huh. As much as it is creativity, it's also problem solving. And look, the best creativity is problem solving, too. It doesn't spring out of, you know, out of nowhere. So... Uh -huh. Um, yeah, it's using a lot of our, um, you know, set our, in, like our intuition, our perception, our memory, yeah. our, you yeah. know, so many different things that are sort of 
going on, you know, at the same time. Sure. So, I mean, if that's a structure that you think that could work, I mean, think about it. It's a, it's, yeah. It could be a really helpful organizing principle. Yeah, um, I, yeah I'm going to think about it more, but I, um, you know, because I was learning a lot about a, you know, finding a container and then bringing things in, in terms of memoir. And I think this would fit in. I mean, I can always do, uh, maybe I'll become a writer, but I'll, I'm going to do a memoir just for my family. You know, not, right. you know. Um, that's a very good objective. Okay, and that's a very good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. And partly it's because you don't put pressure on yourself, but there's a story that you need to get out and that you want your family to know about your mother. Yeah, and also I want to write a memoir just about, you know, my, you know, there are, there are six children. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, and so, but just as a family history, but then later, there could be a memoir about my mother. But I, I love that, um, Tara, you really, um, you know, you just, I, I'm connecting with what you say. Good. You're the expert, so thank you. I'm gonna. Uh, you're very welcome. You're very yeah. welcome. Great. So, okay, next. <laughs> no, next problem solved. No, I mean, it's kind of fun. <laughs> I mean, no, it's really, really very true that so much of writing is thinking about how to solve problems. And within that context, there's great space for creativity and the writing and the, and the juxtaposing of parts and what you bring to it. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like problem solving is some dull you know, mundane thing. I think it's a really important challenge um, that we get, and that's an opportunity for creativity. How do I solve this problem? I've got to introduce this character, this important person in this person's life. How do I bring them into the story? You know, there are just lots of ways to do that. It's a problem to be solved. Right. Um, and, um, and, 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 and I say that in part to dispel the idea that writing is some magical craft that's in the ether that, you know, can't be described. Um, it relates to the rest of the world. It's thinking that just as my researcher friend describe the arc of narrative, there are elements of writing that pertain to, that are very analogous to things that we do and need to do every day. It's not some magical activity off there and we're just some airheads who have nothing else to do, but we just, you know, kind of sit down at the computer and just, you know, let it flow. That isn't how it works at all. I'm sure Stephen King is carefully plotting and solving problems in his plots in his own creative way. Right. It, it yeah. gives you a freedom then to be creative once you have the... Absolutely. Within that space, yeah. it's like you have so much freedom. And it, I mean, that's part of what Pamela and I were talking about. Once you have a sense of what the arena is that you're going to be in, what the domain is, what the what what that universe is that you're operating in, you know, then you can really go to town. Great. So, Good. Do we have any more questions today? Any questions from anyone who's streaming this? Um, Deborah would know that. No but. questions yet from the live stream. Oh, they must be doing something wrong. <laughs> no, I think it's just a sunny day and a lot of people don't have power. That is true. A lot of people don't have power. 
Um, yeah, I, um, I'm fortunate that when I left New York, that I live in a place where the lines are underground. Oh, wow. And that I knew I wouldn't lose power because of course I didn't plan to leave. It was not my intention. I would have preferred to stay in New York. Um, but I did have a freezer full of goodies. <laughs> Things that I did not want to, um, you know, let thaw and refreeze. I'm thinking of all those quails sitting in my freezer. <laughs> and they're not cheap, so, you know, I'll be happy to come home to them in a couple of months <laughs> when I get there. So, when my house is reconstructed. So. Well, I'm glad that you got to California and that it all seems far away. Yeah, it really does. It really does. And when I was speaking to the, the, the demolisher in chief, <laughs> you know, the guy who had the water mitigation team and he's, he, he had arranged with my contractor to do the demolition of the space and, and with me. And he knew the space well after having been there from hours after this huge flood started. Um, you know, I, it was at a remove. It was just, it was at an, an emotional remove as well as a physical remove. And that was really good. And he said to me, you know, I, we had to pull out all of the built-in furniture and the space. And he said, I can show you pictures. And I, I said, I don't want to see pictures. Frankly, I don't want to see pictures of what's missing. I, I, I will imagine it in my head and I know it has to be reconstructed. reconstructed. I, you know, I just don't want to see pictures of more damage. I've had it. So, and that was a way I felt of protecting myself. Yeah. And I'm glad I did that. But it was just instinctive. It was just, no, I don't want to see the pictures. Thank you. It's funny, I was just showing one of my grandsons the pictures of the damage as it happened. I kind of photographed it all because the insurer told me that, you know, everything would need to be documented. So I do take pictures. <laughs> pictures of a house falling, <laughs> you know, not happy. But I have to say, if there are places to be, and I, I, there are two things going on. It's not just, it isn't just being away from the damage. This is also maybe the biggest part of it for me. It's not just being with family, it's, it's, being in a nurturing environment, being with people. I have not, been, with the exception of Debbie and Susan Burnstone, I have not seen anyone, had not seen anyone in five months. I had not been with anyone in five months. And to be here, I haven't been in the main house. And we, you know, so I spend my whole day out, you know, either walking or sitting under the pergola which is where we meet, which is where we eat. Um, and that's where it's so spectacularly beautiful. Um, but it's the end of isolation. And I don't think the isolation was physically good for me. I mean, I did get the shingles, you know, at one point. And I think that I think that, that was just my nervous system yeah. kind of balking at the effects of isolation.